Let's pray. Oh, Lord our God, as we just sang, you alone have the power to redeem. For as Jonah said it, salvation belongs to the Lord. I want to pray as we look at this great text where finally Jonah experiences your redemption. Lord, would you work in our hearts? Would you open our hearts, God, and fill them with joy and gratitude for the salvation that you have brought us? And Lord, for those who are here this morning or even watching this later on or listening even now, Lord, who yet do not know the saving power of Jesus Christ, I pray that by your spirit you would draw them to know salvation, to know you, your steadfast love that is better than life. So Lord, work in us by your spirit in this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church, and it's so good to, uh, to see uh, you here this morning. Uh, guests, if you're here, uh, welcome uh, to you. If this is the first time or second time, still kind of getting acclimated, uh, we're glad you're here as, as well. Uh, I'm Michael White. I get to serve as, uh, as one of the pastors here, do a lot of the preaching and teaching, um, but ultimately we're a church that's led by a plurality of pastors. You saw one of them uh, there in Rick Blakely, one of our lay pastors, praying. Uh, and other pastors here are shepherding you along with me. So we're grateful that you're with us this morning. Jonah chapter 2, really the end of chapter 1 and then uh, Jonah chapter 2. So hopefully you've found your way to Jonah, and if not, like no shame in using the table of contents to, uh, to, to get there. So this story starts uh, on the toilet, I need to tell you. Not with me on the toilet, though, okay? So don't, don't. You're like, where on earth is this going? Uh, don't worry. See, we made some kids happy or excited with that. So his name was uh, Harrison uh, Akinye. Akinye, there we go, Akinye. Um, he was working as a cook on the Jackson 4. That was a tug, tugboat operating off the coast of Nigeria. Um, this is 10 years ago, uh, maybe a little more. And, uh, and Harrison began his day early every morning. He was a cook, he had to get up. Um, and so uh, just to get breakfast ready. And so he'd wake up 4.30, 5 a.m. He would read a psalm. That was his habit. And, and then you got to hit the john, right? Because you know, right? I don't need to describe that to you. And so and then he'd head over to the galley to begin his prep work, get breakfast going and all that. Well, while he was in the bathroom, a rogue wave came and smacked their tugboat so powerful that it, it snapped the tow rope to the uh, oil tanker that the tugboat had been pulling, and that capsized their boat. It, it flipped it upside down, and quickly it sank 100 feet until it came to rest again upside down on the seafloor. In those harrowing moments, Harrison was tossed from the bathroom in his boxer shorts and he watched sadly as three of his shipmates were sucked out into the waters somehow in the chaos he was managed to scramble over to the engineer's office and it was in the engineer's office that remarkably he found a, a small pocket of air a, a bubble that water did not come up into but he was almost naked. He, he, um, he had no food or, or fresh water, and he was surrounded by frigid water. And so really, he was as good as dead. The fact that I can even tell you these details, though, probably tells you something about how this one turned out. After being underwater for 60 hours... A South African dive team happened to be in the area and had been sent to recover the bodies of those who on board had been presumed dead. As they approached the ship, they heard a metallic knocking, and it was Harrison Akinne trying to get their attention. To their shock, they found him alive. You really need to Google his name, O-K-E-N-E, -E, Harrison O-K-E-N-E, -E, and just watch the moment 
because it's on video when they discovered him. It's incredible. Okine was quickly and carefully strapped into diving equipment, then led to a diving bell, which led him to the service. They kept him pressurized. Then he was taken for three days into a decompression chamber, receiving medical attention and care. He looks back and he remembers his experience underwater this way. He says, all around me was just black and noisy. And I was crying and calling on Jesus to rescue me. I prayed so hard. I was so hungry and thirsty and cold. I was just praying to see some light. Rescuers described how when the diver entered the room where Harrison was, again, a hundred feet underwater, and saw him just sitting there in basically a four-foot square air pocket, the diver said, how it wasn't full of water is anyone's guess. I would say someone was looking after him. <laughs> you think? Today, Harrison McKinney, believe it or not, is a class two commercial diver, and he says the ocean is his world, a place where he feels more comfortable and relaxed than anywhere else. Harrison Okine was as good as dead. And think about this. What did he contribute to his own rescue? Nothing. Nothing. And if you're a Christian here this morning, that should resonate with you. Main point of the sermon, if you're taking notes and want to write it down, is just this. Christian, thank God the Lord that God saves you in spite of you Christian thank the Lord that God saves you in spite of you as we continue in Jonah we read about Jonah's rescue and that's the main point of the sermon that though we're rebellious we've rebelled against God though we lack mercy in extending it to others Though we want to go our own way, we should thank God because God is rich in mercy. And as we've been saying, that's the theme of the whole book of Jonah, that God shows mercy to whom he pleases, including unlikely people. In this case, Jonah is that unlikely person. And in all of our cases, we are unlikely recipients of his grace. And so let's jump in. If you're not familiar familiar with the book of Jonah, just high level what you need, need to know is this. You can make sense of what we're going to talk about today. Jonah was God's prophet. Um, he lived around 800 years before Jesus, so um, 8th century B.C., the 700s. Prophets normally were appointed to preach to God's people in either Israel or Judah. But God called Jonah, this is Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, God called Jonah to go out on the road specifically to Nineveh, about 600 miles away. Nineveh was one of the main cities for the mighty and evil Assyrian Empire. Assyria was an existential threat towards Jonah and towards God's people. And in fact, they would later destroy them 50, 60 years after the events in Jonah happened. But anyway, Nineveh is the last place on earth that Jonah wants to go and preach. One, he's feared for his life. Two, he doesn't like those people. So he doesn't want to go. And so Jonah instead does what he wants to do. He runs. Any of you ever run from the Lord? Well, Jonah runs from the Lord. He hops a ship going as fast as and far in the opposite direction as he can. But, we saw this last week in Jonah chapter 1, God comes after him. He sends a storm to intercept him. We talk about divine intervention. He sends a storm to intercept him, almost sinks the ship to get Jonah, until Jonah, while he's on that ship, realizes he's the problem. And so he sacrifices himself by convincing the other sailors to throw him overboard. And that's where we left off last week. With Jonah sinking fast, a shark bait out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, with a raging storm that instantly ceased as soon as he hit the water. 
with pagan sailors who had been on board that ship making vows and sacrifices to the God of Israel in recognition of his power while the prophet of God can't even call out to him in prayer. But there is more to this story because Jonah didn't just rebel against God. He was rescued by God and redeemed And that's where we are today, looking at Jonah's redemption and also yours if you are here and you know Jesus Christ. And so there's three aspects to this that we're going to walk through. First of all, Jonah's redemption involves a sovereign rescue. Jonah's redemption involves a sovereign rescue. Caleb read the text well for us, but just look back at the end of chapter uh, 1, verse 17. And just look at the word of the Lord here. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So God sent that storm after Jonah. But now we see what else? God sent the fish to. And, And the Hebrew word here is quite specific. Uh, the ESV, which I'm preaching from, maybe your translation will use something similar or maybe something slightly different. But the Hebrew says he appointed the fish. God appointed the fish. Or we might say he designated the fish for that purpose, to come and swallow up Jonah. Like This was not some kind of coincidence that just happened. A large fish was dispatched by God to spare Jonah from death. God did that. And then then that's what happened. So we can ask all kinds of questions about this, right? Uh, We did a kids' day camp here this week that was great. Thank you for those who served or helped. Uh, It was a wonderful time. Uh, And our kids, we walked through Jonah. Since we're preaching through this, we walked through Jonah, and our kids had all kinds of good questions like, well, what kind of fish was this? Uh, I don't know. Was this a whale? Well, over in in Matthew's gospel, when Matthew's quoting this, he uses a a word that that is like a whale, and so maybe. Uh, Was it a shark? Was it something else? We don't know. Was was Jonah's skin bleached by the stomach acid of the whale? I I, I don't know. The the truth is, kids ask great questions. The truth is, we just don't know. And and honestly, even, it's not wrong to ask those questions, but, but Scripture is not interested in giving us those answers not interested in telling us those things scripture's not interested in us knowing how it all happened but knowing that it happened and that god made it happen and so that's what we're dealing with today that god sent god appointed the fish to swallow jonah and this was a sovereign rescue let's just pause with jonah for a second think about you do you see friend that this is the same thing he has done for you? Now, he hasn't appointed a fish to come swallow any of you up, I hope. Um, But he has appointed and designated his own dear son, Jesus, for the express purpose of saving you. He sent Jesus from the glory and perfection of heaven into the muck and the mire of our mess for the purpose... Of saving you understand this church like God doesn't redeem people generically he redeems people particularly and God sent a fish specifically to save Jonah and he sent Jesus specifically particularly to redeem you you would believe in him and so back to Jonah like what did Jonah contribute to his rescue let's just think here for a second like Jonah had rebelled against God right he had disobeyed clear instructions from God he had acted worse than a pagan on the ship as he hypocritically talked about oh I fear the God the the Lord the God of Israel the one who made heaven and earth Why was he hypocritical? Well, it was clear he was running from God. He told him that, right? So what is this talk that he feared the Lord? He obviously didn't care much about what God had told him. 
And so Jonah, in other words, had done just about everything you could do to earn God's punishment and God's judgment. And then, what was Jonah doing while he was sinking to the bottom of the Mediterranean? Well, we're not told that he was repenting or promising to God, hey, listen, okay, I'm going to go to Nineveh after all. We're not told that suddenly, as he was sinking down, that God was like, oh, yeah, you know, Jonah, like he had some award-winning work as a prophet, you know, one of my guys, right? He'd done great work for me, so maybe Jonah's worth sparing after all. No, no, quite the opposite. The, the time that Jonah should have been repenting and calling out to God was while he was still on the ship with those poor other sailors, right? Jonah is still in stubborn rebellion when he hits the water. And, and get this, like in his mind, in Jonah's mind, it was the wicked Ninevites who were the problem. Like he's completely blind to himself and his problems and his sin. They were the ones that needed God's mercy, not him, the prophet of God. And, and despite all that, like he was saying, no, I'm going to withhold God's mercy. I'm not going to go and give them what they need. He was going to rebel and resist. And despite all of that, despite the hardness evidently of Jonah's heart, while he was still in his rebellion, God sent the rescue. God appointed the fish. And again, if you're a Christian, isn't this what Jesus did for you? Apostle Paul says this in Romans 5. He says, for while we were still weak, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for who? For the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were still stubborn in our rebellion, while we were still disregarding the instruction of the Lord, while we were still content to go our own way, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, understand this. Like You do not clean yourself up before coming to Christ. It is come as you are. Jesus came to save sinners. He came to save the ungodly. He said, listen, the, the healthy people are, are not in need of a physician or the people who think they're healthy. No, I've, came to, I've come to save the sick. Someone might consider dying for a really good person, maybe, but dying for a really bad person? That is the love that God shows us in Christ. And that, friends, is how God rescued Jonah, and that is how he rescues anyone, anyone, you, in your rebellion, in your sin. How can God do that? How can God look at this rebellious and prophet, rebellious prophet, and just say to him, "Hey, Jonah, I'm going to rescue you." How, how can He look at you and the things that you have done, the rebellion that you have waged against the God, the King of all the universe, and how can He show mercy to you? Well, it's because, as Pastor Richard Sibbs said so well, there is more mercy in Christ than there is sin in us. I love that quote. There is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. Friends, I don't care what you have done. I don't care how royally you have sinned and screwed up and offended the majesty and the glory of God. There is more mercy in Christ than there is sin in you. He would love to redeem you. He would love to rescue you because you cannot out sin the love and mercy of God. That was true for Jonah, and it it's true for you. Thank the Lord that God saves you in spite of you. Notice something else here. God's rescue of Jonah comes at whose initiative? Well, it's God's initiative, right? God determines to save 
Jonah and what? He, he does. He appoints the fish to go swallow up Jonah, right? God decides that. And, and, and again, what is Jonah's role in this? Well, Jonah gets swallowed up, right? He receives the rescue. He responds to the rescue. He remembers, and, and what happens in the rest of chapter 2, finally, he finally remembers God. He ultimately rejoices in the rescue, But who is the one doing the work? Who is the one who initiates it and does it? It's God who saves. Because God shows mercy to whom he pleases. And so friends, if you're a Christian, understand it is God who did that in you, not you. God has done that. He has saved you, not you. Now listen, I know, I hope that if I like went back to the classroom and I like passed out to you like a pop quiz, like a true, false, something... I always hated true false quizzes, right? They're so like tricky, like the way they word them. I'm like, I don't know. I think if I gave you a true false pop quiz that said, you are saved by your works, or I am saved by my works, you would look at that and go, true or false? I am saved by my works. I I think most of you would probably go, "Eh, false. No, I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved by grace. It's by grace that I've been saved through faith. This is not my own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not the result of works so that no one will boast, right? Like, I think you would say false. You would get that right on the pop quiz. But do you understand what that means? Do you understand that that means that if God had not taken the first step to redeem you, you would have never been saved? think back to our friend Harrison Akine who's sitting in his four by four square air bubble on the bottom of the ocean I mean how was he getting out of that situation I mean, he wasn't calling 911 bottom of the ocean no service right he wasn't swimming his way out of there the bends the nitrogen all the things that would get in his bloodstream I mean that would kill him as he went to the top what was he doing he was waiting he was hoping I said earlier that he was praying but he was completely and totally dependent on the rescuers who came for him and friend I want you to understand this clearly like it is the same for you as Jonathan Edwards put it a great American theologian you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary that's what we mean when we say we're not saved by works but we're saved by his grace it is all of grace it's all of grace that he has brought you to himself and so how does that make you feel the way it should make you feel is it should humble you When you understand that I had nothing to do with it, it was all God's kindness and grace towards me in spite of me, that should overwhelm your heart with gratitude that it is all grace. That's why John Newton in the famous hymn pens, he he says, I was lost, but then all of a sudden I was found. I was lost, but then I was found. I was blind, but then all of a sudden I could see. The fact that God loves you in spite of you should lead you to love the gospel. It should lead you to love Jesus. It should lead you to love his grace. It should break your heart in the best way and make you weep to the praise of the mercy that you have found in him. Part of the reason for that response to his sovereign rescue is the other side of the coin and we see this with Jonah's rescue the second thing is that Jonah's rescue in, in includes this um, sobering reality there's a sobering reality that's bound up with what Jonah is experiencing because Jonah was as good as dead facing that death in the face the mercy that God showed him in sending a fish to swallow him up led Jonah to a place of thanksgiving now maybe not as soon as he ought to have gotten there right 
But he got there. Praise the Lord, right? And so the, the bulk of chapter 2 is a psalm of thanksgiving. It follows all the, the typical Hebrew poetic uh, structures of a psalm of thanksgiving, presumably written by Jonah. Uh, most, if not all, of Israel's prophets had been trained as musical poets. So composing a psalm like this while he's waiting in the dark... <laughs> That would have been a good way to pass the time. And maybe more than that, for him to begin processing the things that he had experienced. And so just, just look at it with me. He, he starts out with this sobering reality of this near-death experience that he had. Verse 2, he says, I, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and God answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. And the flood surrounded me, and all your waves and your billows passed over me. In other words, finally, as he's being swallowed up, he finally calls out to God. In the belly of the fish, and literally in the belly of Sheol. That's the Hebrew concept of the grave and the, the place of the dead. And so in this dark, like literally physically dark space, finally he begins to reflect on his experience as the waves and the flood of the sea surrounded him. He keeps going, verse 4, chapter 2, Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. There's some hope. Verse 5, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deeps surrounded me, sinking down. The weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots or the base of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars are closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. This is all poetic, figurative language, but you get the gist, right? Like, his outlook is grim. It's grim. Water's closing in, strangling weeds around his head, going past the underwater mountains, coming down all the way down to the base of them at the sea floor, about to be locked up into the eternal prison of death. Friends, is the finality of death is the sobering reality of it real to you? Is it real to you? Because death will come for all of us. It will come. And we do not know when. Life is fragile. Life is unpredictable. My sweet grandmother passed away in her sleep some, I guess it's 14 years ago now. She didn't have any glaring health issues. She was not particularly old. I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. Just the last goodbye I gave her when we talked on the phone. It was not expected. I can still visualize now, um, probably 25 or more years later, a, a heart-pounding experience I had when I was almost in a head-on collision when I was driving out in California out to a summer mission project. I remember that experience, how terrifying it was. I remember my trembling and my terror, how, how close a call. I remember pulling off on the side of the road and just like shaking and trembling and how long it took before my heart actually stopped racing. I, I know you have your own stories. Your own stories of, of someone who died in your life prematurely, unexpectedly. You have your <laughs> frightening diagnoses. The doctor's visit where they say, hey, come back. Like we, We've got something we need to talk to you about. Like We're, we're concerned about this. Does the sobering reality of that push you into the goodness of the gospel? All of us will die physically. But the reality...
reality of our own rebellion against God means that far more seriously we face the threat of spiritual death, an unending death in God's punishing presence where the worm doesn't die and the fire is never quenched. This is hell. It is not fictional. It is not the fabrication of some angry preacher. You just look at the ministry and the teaching of Jesus. Jesus talks more about hell than heaven, and he describes hell far more vividly. It is real, it is terrifying. And as we saw in chapter 1 last week, you cannot outrun the consequences of your sin. The Lord is a just judge, and he will do what is right. And if you have rebelled against him and have not run to the remedy that he has provided in his son Jesus, then he will sentence you to eternal death. The only hope for sinners like Jonah, the only hope for sinners like, like you and like me, is the mercy of God in Christ. And it's Jonah's reflection on the sobering reality, this near-death experience, this close call, that ultimately leads to the turn that leads him to repentance and leads him to be thankful for God's mercy towards him. That God had brought him, as he says there in verse 6, he had brought his life up from the pit. And so friends, have you made that same journey where the reality of death has instead led you to make a response to the Lord? It's what Jonah does, a sincere response. This is the third point. Jonah continues, again, still reflecting on that experience. When my life was fainting away, it's about out of breath there, underwater. I remembered the Lord. My prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. So after his foolish rebellion, after the life-threatening storm and all the back and forth with sailors that were more pious than he is, God's prophet, after he was tossed overboard, after facing the bitter consequence of his sin to the point that his very life was fainting away, finally, like finally, Jonah remembers the Lord. There in verse 7, finally. And the Lord heard his still perhaps stubborn, but by now desperate and sincere prayer. Be encouraged by that, friend. God hears both your well-composed, measured, quiet, normal prayers during your personal times with him. And God also hears urgent, fired off hastily, Rapid fire, end of your rope kind of prayers. God hears Jonah's prayer. Jonah gets this right here as he's pondering and he's thinking, right? Like he is a prophet. He ought to have some things, right? He says that those who worship worthless idols miss out on the steadfast love of God. See, even the pagan sailors, because of what they experienced and witnessed when Jonah was thrown overboard and then everything you know, stilled and ceased, like they saw God is real. Jonah's God, Yahweh, is true. Their so-called gods hadn't been able to save them. They'd called on them. They couldn't. But, even though the sailors saw that, knew that, came back and made sacrifices, that didn't mean that they had a relationship with God, that they knew the steadfast love of God, that they were living and resting in God's steadfast love. This week in the middle of a, just a, a hard moment, I was, I don't know if you get this way, but I was all up in my feelings and just you know turned upside down. And usually when I do that, sometimes it takes me longer than it ought to, but eventually, like, I'll turn to the Lord in prayer. 
and I did that by using uh, just one of my favorite uh, books of prayers. It's called The Valley of Vision. Um, and, uh, and I turned to one, and I was, I was praying through it. And, uh, and I got to this part. I'm like, yes, Lord, this is, this is, this is, this is what is true. And the prayer says this, because you are mine, I can live by your strength. Oh, sorry, I can live by your life. I can be strong in your strength. I can be guided by your wisdom so I can pitch my, my thoughts and my heart in you. W with you, I can live without other things. For you are God, all sufficient. And the glory and peace and rest, joy of the world, that's creaturely and perishing things in comparison with you. Friends, that's what it's like to know the steadfast love of God. To know His steadfast love. To have Him means to have everything, no matter what you lack. And when you realize you have that, this is the difference between knowing about God, like those pagan sailors had known, and actually knowing God and being in touch with his and, and knowing and loving the steadfast love of God that, that's the difference and that's what leads in ultimately to thanksgiving just look at Jonah in verse 9 with the voice of thanksgiving I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay salvation belongs to the Lord finally he gets it he seems to be saying okay I get your steadfast love now I'll heed the Lord. What? What? I'm, I'm going to go now to Nineveh. I'm going to go. What I vowed, I'm going to pay. And and finally, he seems to get it that God has mercy on whom He pleases, right? That that God saved Jonah in in spite of Jonah, and God would potentially show mercy to Nineveh despite Nineveh, and all that is because of salvation. Salvation belongs to who? not me <laughs> not you I don't get to dole it out or pick and choose salvation belongs to the Lord he's the one that initiates it he's the one who brings it and finally Jonah responds the right way he gets it and thus Jonah's long road to redemption ends as all good stories do with vomit <laughs> Now, we started on the toilet and now we're here vomit verse 10 the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land and he went and did what God had told him to do we see that next week here, here's the point of it all church God saves religious people he does he, he saves churchgoers Sunday school teachers, kids ministry workers, bless all of you. Rogers Cafe servants, bless you. We love donuts and coffee. He saves prophets. He does. But God also saves irreligious. Irreligious. People who can't find Genesis in the Bible. If that's you, there's no shame much less Jonah in the Bible. Man, I'm like, oh, where is it? Right? God delight, delights to save the religious and the irreligious. If all this is new to you, if all this seems strange to you, God would delight to rescue you and save you if you don't know him. God delights to save the moral, straight-laced, never done drugs, never broken the law, other than the speed limit, of course, right? perfect attendance in school yada 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 the goody two shoes God delights to save people like that but God also delights to save the immoral the greedy, the violent, the thieves the liars, the cheaters, the sexually promiscuous and here's what God also likes to do God likes to help convince the first group that they're a lot more like the second group than they actually realize the point is, no matter who you are, no matter what you have done, whether you have sinned boldly, 
Everybody knows it? Or you have sinned secretly. Whether you have sinned in culturally acceptable ways, or your sin is more Christianly respectable, if you're a Christian, thank the Lord but God, because God has saved you in spite of you. And if you're not a Christian, friend, I would invite you to come to Jesus, who alone provides rescue from eternal death. God sent Jesus particularly to redeem a people for himself, that if you would believe in him, if you would trust the life that he lived, the righteous life that he lived, the innocent death that he died, the powerful resurrection he experienced, if you, you would put your faith in him, that God would swap your sins and put your sins on Jesus. Instead of you being characterized by your sin, you'd be characterized by God's righteousness. You would have life and hope and forgiveness in his name. So all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. We may have chosen our sins differently, but all of us have fallen short of God's glory. All of us need Jesus' rescue. And so if you've not believed that today, I would invite you to believe that even right now. I would urge you that way. Talk to somebody around you. Come find me or another pastor or somebody after the service. We'd love to talk to you more about that. But Christian, if you're a Christian, I just want to ask you, are you thankful for your salvation? Are you thankful? Do you reflect on where God has brought you from? Not, not in some kind of prideful way, but humbly. Like, like, are you just in awe of the fact that God would save you? That God would graciously work in your life? That, that God would do that for you, understanding you didn't deserve it or merit it or earn it in any way? Just sink into the bottom of the ocean and all of a sudden a, a, a fish comes and swallows you up. You didn't ask for the fish. The fish came and God rescued you and saved you. Christian, are you thankful for your salvation? Because understanding that you don't deserve to be saved is, is key for any growth that you're going to make as a Christian. That salvation belongs to to the Lord. And, and thank God it does because if it were up to you or me then I wouldn't make it and you wouldn't make it. And if you could lose your salvation, you would. It's a miracle that God has saved you. Friend, do you think of yourself in that way as a living, breathing miracle? Harrison Okine, our sailor, he's a Christian. He's a believer. His wife had actually texted him some key verses from Psalm 54 the, the, the night before everything happened. And somehow, I don't know how, but he, he had managed to secure a Bible within his air bubble. <laughs> and so literally, like, he's, uh, he's got nothing but a Bible. He's sitting there in his boxer shorts hearing all these crazy sounds and noises on the bottom of the ocean. And he's like, well, I'm just going to turn to Psalm 54 and he read it, he prayed to it, that was his hope. And after he returned to the surface, after he was medically cleared and all that, he returned to his church, which is the redeemed Christian Church of God, Nigeria. And he read these words, Oh God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. Oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. Behold, God is my helper the Lord is the upholder of my life. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked upon the triumph of my enemies. Dear brothers and sisters, let the glorious grace of the gospel, in all its undeservedness, fuel in you humble thanksgiving and sacrificial living for the glory of his great name because God saved you in spite of you let's pray Lord how great
grateful we are. But Lord, you don't just love us unconditionally, you love us counterconditionally. Lord, you pursue us in our rebellion. Like Jonah, you came and swallowed us up, God, when we were lost and sinking. We were lost. And now by your grace we are found. We were blind, but now by your grace we see. Lord, would you make that real to us, those of us who know you? Would you make it real in us in ways that it provides sustaining thanksgiving and joy in life? That yes, circumstances change and come and, and, and things are hard sometimes. But Lord, would this be the anchor of our souls, our great hope? And Lord, for those who may not know you, God, would you save them, come swallow them up. God, bring them to you that they may rejoice and know the gift that we know. We pray all this in Jesus' name.